Well, amen. Happy Easter. Good morning. Welcome to Asbury. My name is Andrew Forrest. I'm the senior pastor here. Y'all made it and you look so good. I'm so glad to see you today. This is the best day of the year because it's the best news of all time. And God has given us another year. He's given us today. He's given us all these people around us. Why don't you turn to 100 of your dear friends and say, good morning. Happy Easter. Good to see you. Friends, you can remain standing this morning. I'd like to have a brief prayer, and then we're going to have a traditional Easter greeting. Let's pray. So come, thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing. We come to sing thy praise. Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign o'er us, thou ancient of days. Here's this traditional Easter greeting that we're going to use this morning, friends. I say, Christ is risen, and you say, Christ is risen indeed. So Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Final time, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We're so glad you're here. Let's sing together today.
And that's our declaration that we stand on the power of the resurrected Christ as we come and celebrate your death, your resurrection, and your conquering sin and death. The chains that have bound us are no longer. And so, Lord, we come and worship you in this place. And we're thankful that you would meet us here. And so, Lord, in the quiet, Lord, let us reflect on where you have brought death to life as we reflect on the words that Jesus shared with his disciples as we pray together, the Lord's Prayer together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. It's obvious I'm standing in a playground, and it's obvious the point of a playground for the children to play and to play freely. What might not be immediately obvious is the road back behind the playground and the fence between the road and the playground. And I think you can make a good case that the fence actually is essential to the playground because the fence enables the children to play freely. Here at Asbury, we're a Bible reading church. And tomorrow, we're starting a new Bible reading plan through the Ten Commandments and the law in the Old Testament. Now, contrary to popular opinion, the point of the Ten Commandments and the law is not to restrict human freedom. It actually is to enable human freedom and human flourishing because the law and the Ten Commandments are a clear boundary to show us where life must take place. So pick up your Exodus reading guide. They're free. Take as many as you can use and start reading with us tomorrow. Reading the Bible will change your life. Then all that will be supported by a church-wide Bible study this coming Wednesday, 6.30 to 8 o'clock, Wednesday, the 3rd of April. If you've never been to one of our all-church Bible studies, it will not just be like you and me in an empty room with four other people. No, there will literally be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. I'll do about a 45-minute study, and then we'll do about 45 minutes of Q&A led by our middle school and high school students because these all-church Bible studies are meant to be intergenerational. So if you're a Bible expert or you don't know anything about the Bible, this event is for you. So start reading Exodus and be here this coming Wednesday for this all-church Bible study. I'm looking forward to it, and I'll see you there. So don't forget to leave without your Exodus books this morning and don't miss our first Bible study this Wednesday. It's gonna be an awesome time here at Asbury. We're a Bible reading church, as Pastor Andrew shared. And that means individually and that means corporately together. And so we invite you to join us and be a part of that as we read through Exodus together. Well, as we continue to worship here in this space, we invite you to check in. There's a QR code if you're a guest with us this morning, or if you've got the Asbury app on your phone, go ahead and check in with us there. Let us know that you're here. That helps our pastoral team better care for our congregation. As we continue to worship, our hosts are gonna come forward and they're gonna take up an offering. And if you're a guest with us this morning, we don't want you to feel any obligation to give. In fact, we've got a gift right outside through those doors at the welcome table just to say welcome. We're so glad you're here worshiping with us on Resurrection Sunday and our hope and prayers that you would come back and worship with us and be a part of our family here at Asbury. But if you are a member, you know that we get to give sacrificially and generously ultimately because God has given us all this and we just get to give back a portion of what we have so graciously received from him. And so as the hosts come forward, we're gonna sing one of our favorite songs around here, Living Hope because that's what we're celebrating today, the hope that we have in the resurrection of Christ. So let us continue to worship. We're glad you're here this morning. How great the castle that laid its 
Let's, let's pray together. Lord, what a phrase. You are our living hope. We are so grateful, Lord, that love has conquered death. That we have nothing to fear. That you died for us, been raised, and now raised us up with you. Lord, I pray that you'd send your spirit into this place now as we open the Easter story. And I pray that you'd open hearts and open minds. Lord, I'd pray all around the world today where there are billions and billions of Christians gathering, Lord, I'd pray that there'd be spiritual awakening today. That there'd be like revival. Start here in our city. Start it here in our church. Start here in our country, oh Lord. Bring us from death to life. Lord, I'm praying that now that you would restore our hope, those of us who perhaps have forgotten what we once had, or have abandoned our first love, bring us back to you, Lord. And then for others of us, Lord, I pray that you will bring us into the kingdom. Give us the courage to say yes to you. Lord, we're desperate. We're desperate for that living hope. And to that end, Lord, therefore I pray that you would now take my words and speak through them, that you would take our thoughts and think through them. Lord, shine light into our minds, illuminate the darkness. And then God, I pray that you take our hearts and fill them with joy and hope. That's our prayer today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. What I find really interesting about the Easter story is so obvious when you think about it, but in hindsight, it's easy to overlook it, is namely this. Literally no one, no one, no one expected the resurrection that first Easter Sunday morning. They came to the tomb early that morning expecting to find death, and instead they found life. The reason that matters to me is it means that God is doing a thing that we can't understand until it happens. And it means, therefore, because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, there is literally always hope for those who trust in his name. And hope is what we need. See, I'm familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I know you gotta have your, you know, your food and your drink and your shelter. I understand that. If we're gonna talk, uh, wallpaper choices. You don't want to have been uh, fasting for the past three weeks or something, right? It'll be a focus as how hungry you are or whatever it is. I understand that. But the truth is, hope is actually more important than even food and drink and shelter. And I'm going to prove it to you. You ready? Because if hope were not more important than just our basic physical and material needs being met, there would be no despair in our time. There would be no desperation. Instead, we are surrounded by despair and desperation. Why? Because we are without hope. I'll tell you where this was really evident to me, man, is the Super Bowl this year. Now, I'm not talking about the place. I'm talking about the commercials. Because I was there in my house with some friends watching the Super Bowl, and I started to notice a pattern. So I've chosen a couple of still images from Super Bowl commercials from this year that I'm going to show you. I'm going to tell, tell me if you see the pattern. Here's the first image, number one. These are different commercials taken. Here's number two. Let's go to the third one, number three. Anybody sensing a pattern yet? Let's go to number four, made up of a couple different images. Let's say number five. How about number six here? And here are the seventh one. We'll stop here. Anybody notice the theme? As I was there watching in real time, I began to notice that commercial after commercial after commercial kept featuring a celebrity, almost always an aging celebrity or a celebrity whose fame and creative time was from a previous era, acting ironically. Now, as long as there has been mass media, celebrities have been used as pitchmen in ads. You have Joe DiMaggio, you know, saying all the cool guys smoke a Chesterfield, something like that. And the point there is 
if you want to be as elegant as Jolt and Joe, then you should smoke this particular cigarette. What's interesting nowadays in all these commercials that I saw is that it wasn't so much that. It was more like the celebrities were, were breaking the fourth wall, winking at us, acting again, as I say, a little bit ironically. And the, the reason this matters, I mean, it's just a commercial, is like, well, it's almost like we're stuck. Have you noticed this? In fact, the movies and the television shows that were advertised during the Super Bowl, what were they? They were nearly all reboots of previous creative material. Hey, it's like at a previous time, we piled up in the creative bank creative activities, and now we're just merely drawing down rather than making any deposits. Isn't it like we're stuck? There was one political ad during the uh, Super Bowl this year. Here's a still from it. And even this ad was so obviously drawing from the presidential campaign of 1960. That was 64 years ago. It's like we're in the same place. Now, it's not that none of them were funny or clever. Some were, some weren't. My particular favorite was this one with Arnold. Remember this one? <laughs> like a good neighbor, State Farmers Dea. That was my favorite. It was creative. It was good. And yet the point still holds. Now, why is this? Anybody remember the Jetsons? It was supposed to take place in 2062. George Jetson was supposed to be born in 2022. They got flying cars. They live in spaceships. Remember 24 years ago at the turn of the millennium, there was so much hope that new technologies, these new discoveries are going to bring us into this amazing future. What's happened these last 10 years? Have you noticed? It's like we're turning in on ourselves. It's like we're stuck. And the young people totally feel it. Now, here is a, a, a chart that shows survey data from a question that's been asked of every single 12th grade class going back to the 1970s. And the questions are these. Do you feel like it's hard to have hope for the world? And do you wonder if there's a purpose to life given the current situation? And, and the exact numbers don't matter to you this morning, but just look at the color scheme. You see that? It starts with, at the time, would have been the youngest of the baby boomers, and then moves into the, the generation we call Generation X, and then to the millennials, and then that last color, that purple color there, that so-called Generation Z, the young people today. And young people today are saying, over 40% of them, that it's hard to have hope for the future. Now, what's interesting about this is that the economists tell us that more people under the age of 35 own houses now than at any previous time. And the unemployment rate for people in their teens and 20s is lower than any time in the past 50 years. There is no nationwide draft. We have abundant energy. We have amazing things delivered to our doorstep, all these incredible medical breakthroughs. And yet our people are without hope. This is not just psychological, by the way. Here's a devastating chart. It shows emergency room visits from our young girls because of acts of self-harm. In the last 10 years, it's been skyrocketing. Our young people are literally sick. Why? Because they have no hope. And it's happening to all of us. Now, here's hope. Okay, here's my definition. Very practical. You're in a dark room and you want the light on. It's not hope that makes you get up, walk across the room, and flip the switch on. That's not hope. You know that's going to work. You understand, even if you don't know electrical engineering, you understand circuitry and electricity and the light bulb. When you flip the light on, you have light. Okay. No, no. For our purposes, hope is the idea that something good is going to happen, even though you can't literally and specifically say out exactly how it will come to pass. And now you see why we are so creatively stuck these days? Because the very act of creation requires hope. Only God can literally create something out of nothing. But we've all been created in God's image. Everybody you've ever seen was created in God's image. And one of the things that means is that we were all creators in a small c sense. So you take the ingredients and you make a pie and there wasn't a pie before, you're a creator. You start a business and there wasn't a business before. You write a screenplay. You form a family. You have children. It's all the same principle. Have you noticed? Have you seen the headlines? 
all across the industrialized world, the birth rates are falling. Young people don't even want to have children. Now why? What's happening? We don't have hope. To start a business, to get married, to make dinner, whatever it is, requires hope. It says there's a reason why I'm doing this. Something will turn good. And we're lacking it now. This is so, so serious. And you don't really see an obvious way out. I mean, we have a big presidential election coming up this year. Even if your guy wins, I know that you're not feeling totally hopeful because you know there's another half of the country that thinks that you're crazy, that believes the opposite of you. It's not like the election, whoever wins, and elections do matter. It's not like when the election happens, all of a sudden everything will be fixed among us. We're sick. We're stuck. And yet, can I tell you today, though I don't see any way out of our current cultural sickness, I am hopeful. Because of this, John chapter 20, verse 1 and following. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Okay, Jesus is crucified on Friday afternoon. And remember, in the Jewish calendar, Sabbath begins at sundown. So it begins at sundown on Friday. So there's a little bit of a hustle and bustle in the Gospels to get the body of Jesus buried before sundown. And because Passover was that next Sabbath, it was a high holy day, it was even more important to finish the business before sundown. So the Bible tells us that Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich disciple of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, they get the body of Jesus and they get it into the, uh, into the tomb that Joseph has recently purchased that has recently been hewn out of the rock in which nobody has been laid. And they're able to just to get it in time. They ask the body for Pilate. They're able to lay the corpse of Jesus just in time before sundown. But this means they have not prepared the body appropriately for burial. Now, if the Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday, when does it end? On sundown on Saturday. The problem with the Sabbath being over at sundown on Saturday is now it's dark. And so therefore, Sunday morning at daybreak is the earliest that it's practically possible for the women to get to the tomb to care for the body of Jesus. That's why they're there early that Sunday morning. And that's why Mary Magdalene is walking up to the tomb in the dark. And this is what she finds. She saw, 20 verse 1, that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, verse 2, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Jesus, on that Sunday prior, we call Palm Sunday, has entered Jerusalem to shouts of acclamation, Hosanna! Because the idea was, maybe this is the long-promised king, the, the child of David, who's going to restore the kingdom to Jerusalem and Mount Zion. And the Romans will be defeated, and the peace and the blessings will come, the time that was prophesied back in the Old Testament. So that's why everybody is so enthusiastic on Palm Sunday. And then it quickly turns in those same crowds that on Sunday yelled Hosanna. On Friday yelled crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus is crucified, dead, and buried. So these people that were his friends and his followers, Mary Magdalene, Peter, the other disciple, and so on. Not only is it the loss of their friend who died, what is maybe the cruelest possible way? crucifixion not only did this innocent man die like that but also their hopes also died with him he, he was the great hope in a way that's very hard for us to understand a political and religious figure in the same time bringing in the kingdom of God and he was killed thereby proving it was all for naught so Mary runs to where the male disciples are verse 3 Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. Verse 4, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. It's almost as if Jesus very polite guy and he made his bed 
before the resurrection that morning. All the fabric is just put up so neatly. And Peter stoops down into the tomb because you got to remember it's a long, low thing to look down in there. And he sees the folded up grave clothes, but no Jesus. But he doesn't understand. See, that first Easter Sunday in the morning, the only thing they could possibly see was death. Where is it in your life that you have decided there is no hope in that situation? Is it a family member that you feel is totally lost? Is it a deep addiction? Is it a diagnosis? Or is it the result of death? And now the grief that's on the other side, I will never be happy. There is no hope. Nothing now can ever come to any good. Peter is there. He sees the empty tomb, but he cannot believe the resurrection. Here's what happens next. Then the other disciple, verse 8, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. In other words, he saw that Jesus was not there. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So although he now believes that Jesus isn't there, he doesn't understand that the one who is dead has been raised to new life on the third day. We, we, we are dying spiritually as a people these days because we don't have hope. And without hope, there's no creative force. There's no potential. There's no reason to get up tomorrow morning. Now, John is a master storyteller, and what he does next is it's like he shines a spotlight in the dark on one particular human life. This disciple of Jesus named Mary Magdalene. Here's what happens next. But Mary, verse 11, stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Look what she sees, verse 12. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. She sees angels. And they said to her, verse 13, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. It's almost as if the only thing she can understand is hopelessness and grief and despair. Everywhere else in the Bible where people meet angels, and by the way, the word angel is from the Greek word angelos. It just means messenger. These are just divine messengers, these spiritual beings. Everywhere else they show up, they're luminous and powerful, and people are afraid. Mary Magdalene's hopelessness is so complete, she can't even really recognize the angels for who they are. I wonder, I wonder for how many of us, it's like there's just no hope. I mean, listen. Life could be right there, but if you're convinced there's no hope, you'll die. Now, there's two different types of funny, right? There's like a, like a satirical, like um, ha-ha, silly funny. This is fine. I like that type of humor, but there's also like a deep mirth that just comes from joy. You know, like, like a, a couple have been married for 50 years and they love each other and their love has been purified over those years and they like making jokes with each other and the grandkids like to see it and it's just like this deep mirth and joy. I think that's what God is like. Look what happens next. Having said this, verse 14, Mary turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Can I tell you what just breaks my heart? There are people all around us and even here today. And Jesus could be standing at their elbow and they wouldn't know it. See, this desire for hope more than a desire, this actual need, this existential need for hope is true for everybody. But so many people are dying from despair. They don't know there's a reason to be hopeful. 
Mary turns around. The resurrected Lord is right there, and she doesn't even see him. Jesus said to her, verse 15, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. You know what I love about that detail? He said, that's obviously what Mary told the disciples later. When I first saw him, I thought he was the gardener. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Complete despair. And then Jesus said to her, verse 16, Mary, is that not just the most beautiful sentence in the Bible? Mary. And then she turned and said in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means my teacher. He calls her by name and she turns and now she finally understands. The Lord calls her by her name and in the name. The one who called her in existence, who knit her together in her mother's womb, who's been with her, the one whom she saw take his last breath on the cross, now with new life in his lungs, says it to her, Mary, and she turns and believes. It's so gorgeous. Do you know what I believe? I believe that Jesus knows every person by name. And he's desperate that they would put their hope in him. I wonder, church, for some of us, if one of our problems in the American church is that we're not desperate enough for the desperate. I'll just confess to to, to me. I'll just confess my own sins here. So often I'm self-satisfied. I got mine. I let them warn about theirs. Why am I not more desperate for all the people around us who are literally dying, deaths of despair? Not, why am I not more desperate to, to tell them about the good news of the Lord, the one who is dead, has been raised again? Mary, he says, because when Jesus calls a man or a woman, a boy or a girl by name, there's something about the voice. They turn and then they believe. Where have you given up hope this morning? Where have you just decided in that area of my life or overall in life or in politics or in society or in our family or with that addiction or that disease or that death, there is no hope. Where have you given over so that you cannot even see or hear the Lord standing right next to you calling you by name? Mary, he says, she turns, she believes. And I love how it ends. This is verse 18. It's so gorgeous. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. She becomes the first missionary. I have seen the Lord. See, we talk a lot in church with certain Christian phrases, which I believe, which I ascribe to, about Jesus dying for our sins, which he did, and he being raised again to new life, which he was, thanks be to God. But, I think sometimes we don't quite connect the dots totally together. Leslie Newbegin was once asked, was he an optimist or a pessimist? He was a longtime missionary to India and a bishop in England. And he said, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. In other words, there is a reality that's entirely different from how we see things. There's a life that we currently would be never be able to predict. They went to the tomb expecting death, and instead, God surprised them with life. The reason this matters, Christian brothers and sisters, is because if Jesus Christ is risen from the grave, it literally is the case. There is no reason ever to have hope. That God has used Jesus as a great down payment, a guarantee of the future reality where everything sad comes untrue. If the Son of God was crucified and betrayed under Pontius Pilate and buried in the ground and three days later was raised to new life because of the love and power of the Father and the gift of the Spirit, then there is literally no reason not to be hopeful. It is everything. If Jesus is not risen, we have nothing. And if he is risen, we have everything. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Okay, maybe in this area of my life, I could be more hopeful. Maybe I could start a business or, or get married or, or create something. Maybe, maybe. But in this particular area, there is no hope. When it comes to death, it might seem like that death has the final word. 
No doubt you followed this week the same story I did, the terrible story of that bridge collapsing in Baltimore. Here's the picture of the aftermath. All those many tons of steel dropping into the frigid water. Miraculously, there was a mayday call given by the captain and the pilot of the vessel, and the state police were able to stop the traffic with just 40 seconds to spare. It's unbelievable. Nevertheless, the word was not able to be given in quite enough time for the eight construction workers who were working there. And the bridge collapsed. You've seen the video. It collapses almost immediately, and they're buried under tons of steel in the frigid water. So then the family begins to gather. The families gather at a local restaurant, waiting through the night once they've gotten the word of the terrible loss. Waiting, waiting, hoping against hope. Now, you may be thinking, sure, maybe we could be hopeful in X or Y area, but when it comes to death, I mean, death has the final word. And if that is the case, then we actually shouldn't be hopeful. No matter how life goes, if we all just end up going back to the dust anyway, and everybody we love just stays dead, and every creative act ends up turning back into the dust, then it does sort of seem like life is meaningless. And what's the point? So... In the middle of the night, they get word, those eight families, that two of their fathers and brothers and sons have been rescued, plucked out of death from the water. One man totally unscathed. Can you imagine what that family must have felt like at that moment? A hope that's too large almost to believe until they saw him and put their arms around his neck and touched his hands like Thomas with the risen Lord. I wonder if they didn't really believe. But then what about the other six families? They were waiting and waiting, and then finally the divers came back and the authorities called off the search and the six other men have been pronounced dead there in the dark, frigid waters. So what good is hope if that's still what happens? You might want to ask, what's the difference between the two groups of families, between those whose brothers and sons and fathers had been rescued from the water and those who weren't? Can I tell you what the Christian answer is? The only difference between these two families is a difference just in time. That's it. It's just a difference of waiting. The end result is exactly the same because Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. Death does not have a hold on the people of God. Jesus says in Revelation that he holds in his hands the keys of death and Hades. In other words, they can't control you or hold you anymore. This is why, although I don't see a way out of our current cultural sickness, I am hopeful. I am breathing today, which is proof God isn't finished with me. And you're breathing, which is proof God isn't finished with you. The Lord is up to something. I'm hopeful. There is no situation even beside the grave of a loved one in which we are not hopeful because Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. So here's how we're going to close our service today. We're going to hold fast to the hope of the Lord. We're going to sing a song here in a second. It's a beautiful song that retells the great story of salvation. It's called Jesus Saves. And before we get there and then during that song, I'm going to lead a prayer. And for some of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, we got to have our hope renewed today. We have forgotten our first love. We've abandoned the hope. We've allowed death to sort of loom over this area or that area of our lives. No more. Jesus Christ is risen, which means there's always hope. And then for those of us who have put our faith in Christ, I want us to be praying for our world and our country, our city, and particularly our church. I want us to be praying for those loved ones we know who don't know the hope of the Lord that today they would hear him calling them like Mary in the garden and they turn and believe. And then there's a third group. Some of us are here and we don't have hope. We've never put our faith in the Lord. And it says in the Bible that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, we shall be saved. And today can be that day for many of us here today. Today can be the day in which you hear the Lord calling your name and you put your faith in him, our living hope. With that in mind, therefore, let's all take a breath and close our eyes as I lead us in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners today. 
We've doubted, we've turned aside, we've allowed death and despair to overwhelm us. Restore us back to hope today. Give us the courage to keep going and the faith and hope to carry on. Lord, hear our prayers this morning for the people that we love who don't know you. There are so many desperate people, Lord. We're praying in this city and in other cities around the world and other churches and other communities that you would reach out to our loved ones. Call them by name, Lord. Open their hearts, open their eyes so they can put their trust in you. And then this morning, Lord, there's some of us here and we've never put our faith in you. And God, we believe, help our unbelief. We believe in our hearts you've been raised from the dead. We confess with our mouth. Lord Jesus, come and save us. Give us the hope that cannot be taken away and the love that conquers even death. We praise you, O oh Lord, and we thank you for the gift of Easter, the greatest news in history. And we pray that now, Lord, you'd come and save us. That's our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And all the people said, amen. Hey, friends, we got a petting zoo. Did you know that over in the gym? We got a lot of donuts. It's allowed on Easter. Eat as many as you want. Pick up your Exodus reading guide on the way out. I'll see you Wednesday night for Bible study. And now for the last time this year, the best words in all of history, friends. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Go in peace. Happy Easter. Be hopeful.